Welcome to Hot Chips 31. Keynote 2. Dr. Philip Wong on What Will the Next Note Offer Us? All right, um, we're going to start the second keynote of this year's Hot Chips. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Philip Wong. He's the Vice President of Corporate Research at TSMC, where he's responsible for exploring new technologies. Prior to TSMC, Dr. Wong was the Willard R. and Inez Kerr Bell Professor at the Stanford School of Engineering. He spent 16 years at IBM, where many of his early research works led to productized technologies. His work has contributed to advancements in nanoscale science and technology, uh, semiconductors, solid state devices, and electronic imaging. He's an IEEE fellow, he's published a book, has over 50 patents and over 600 publications. Please join me in, in welcoming Dr. Philip Wong. All right, good afternoon. Uh, today I'd like to talk about technology, obviously, right? And uh, the title is what will be the next node offer us. But I'm not here to make a product announcement. I will not talk about products. Uh, but I do want to talk about a vision for the future. What will the next technology node, node after node, generation after generation, what will it offer us, right? I'm talking about 30 years from now, in this, in the, from now till 30 years later, what will the next technology node generally offer us? I'm not talking, gonna talk about what is the next technology node, namely the five nanometer or three nanometer technology node. Okay, so when we talk about technology node going forward from generation to generation, usually that's what comes to mind. You know, Moore's law, number of transistors increasing year after year on an exponential curve, that's what we come to know as what a technology would offer us, right? If you think about Moore's law, it's really about density, device density, and that this is figure one from Gordon Moore's paper, right? And the y-axis says uh, relative manufacturing cost per component, basically cost per function. On the x-axis, the number of transistors or number of components on the chip. Right? Each of the generations of each of the curve represents a technology generation, and the cost goes down, a number of components increase at each of the generation, and that's enabled by increasing device density from generation to generation. Now, density matters because density is the one's primary driving force for many of the good things that we come to think of it. If you look at density today, so there's a real product level data that I'm showing in this graph in here. Density, y-axis is, uh, is relative density, x-axis is the number of years. It is still on a straight line exponential curve on a log linear plot. So I would like to state without any doubt that Moore's law is well and alive. Right? It's not that, it's not snowing down, it's not even sick, it's well and alive. Okay, so having said that, density is really important because many of the good things come out of density, right? Speed, energy efficiency, power efficiency, all the things that we somehow associate Moore's Law with, all the good things, good attributes that we associate Moore's Law with comes from density, right? And so it is often the case that we conflate these other attributes that we'd like to have, energy efficiency, power efficiency, speed, and so on, with Moore's law. So the fact that processor speed, clock speed has saturated does not mean Moore's law is dead. Densities keep increasing, just like Dr. Moore has predicted many, many years ago. All right, so now density is important uh, because Let's imagine if you have a transistor that's really good, high speed, 
high energy, highly energy efficient, low power, but without density. So on the left side, you see a chip with high transistor density. On the right side, I have a hypothetical chip that has low device density, but fantastic transistors. That still, does, still doesn't do you any good because if you don't have density, first of all, you don't have enough memory and you know how bad it would be. Second of all, there will be no multi-core chips because there's enough, not enough devices to build many cores. Third, there would not be any accelerators because you would need transistors to build your accelerators. And finally, because the transistors are spaced very far apart, the wire delay will really kill you. The delay will really slow very big chips. So transistor performance by itself without density is no good. Density is really important. All right, let's talk about that device technology. You know, this is what I am familiar with. Start from today's technology. Today we have the most advanced technology, seven nanometer, and TSMC has been offering the world's first seven nanometer technology, and many of you may be using it, and hopefully, hopefully you, you, many of you who are on the 16 nanometer FinFET will continue to use that and go to seven nanometer and so on. In five nanometer node, which is literally the next node, or the next node following five nanometer, and what we call N5P, we will have the best performance, the highest device density, we'll use extensive EUV layers to lower the cost, and design ecosystems is ready on the N5 node, and uh, all the, we're already in risk production. And then after N5 and N5P, there will be N3 and so on, and for many years to come, all right? Now, all these numbers today doesn't mean a lot because it used to be the technology node, the node number means something, some features on the wafer. Today, these numbers are just numbers. They're like models in a car. It's like BMW 5 Series or Mazda 6. It doesn't matter what the number is, it's just a destination of what the next technology look, the name for it. So let's not confuse ourselves with the name of the node with what the, node, what the technology actually offer. Okay? So now, of course, you hear a lot about Moose Law's dead and so on and so forth, and in a way, People who make those points do have a point. So let me just address this elephant in the room. And today, if you look at a transistor and a fin fat, and what I show on the, on the uh, upper right-hand corner is a, pack, a, fra a, fi a fragment of the fin. And the fin is about maybe 10 nanometer or slightly less than 10 nanometer. And if you use a very high resolution transmission electron microscope, you're gonna actually see each individual atoms. You can count them, you still need both fingers, both hands, and maybe the toes to count the number of atoms in a fin, but not much more than that, okay? So if you go by two-dimensional device scaling, which is the really powerful knob that we have so far in making new transistors, in providing you density, if you go by two-dimensional scaling by itself, you quickly see that we're down to very few number of atoms, and very soon you run out of atoms which is true. On the other hand, this powerful knob that we have been using is not the only knob that we have at our disposal. And in fact, if you look at Moore's Law, it's really a history of innovation. When Gordon Moore wrote this paper in 1965 about the cramming more components into the, into the integrated circuit chips, Bob Danas scaling rule wasn't even invented, right? So and then, a couple of years later, the knot skating came around, and when the knot skating ran its course, the industry went to equivalent skating. We go to a strange silicon, increasing mobility, high K metal gauge for reducing the equivalent oxide thickness to give you better transistor turnoff characteristics and so on. And then when the two-dimensional transistor, bulk transistor run out of steam, we switched to a three-dimensional structure, fin fat, and then more recently, we have design technology called optimization to increase device density. 
So Moore's Law is really a history of innovations. And going forward, what we expect to see are, are more innovations in those directions, in maybe not in the same direction, but in different directions, that provides you, would provide you from technology node to technology node, continuous benefits, node after node. And that's what we really care about. We don't really care about how big the device is and how, how many atoms there are. There are many ways to lead that leads to room. So today I'd like to talk a little bit about all these many ways that we could expect to see going forward in the next 30 years. Let's start from the top in building systems. If you read Gordon Moore's paper in page three, many of you may have, may have read page one and two and then forgot about page three. <laughs> if you go to page three, uh, there's a, uh, uh, in one of the paragraphs it says, uh, building integrating chips into systems. Basically, what it says is that if you build systems composed of many chips and put them together, today we call them chipless, at the, at the time, 1965, there was no such, no such thing as chiplet, but today we call them chiplets. You would be able to construct more, economic system, more economical systems as well as combining the best performances, best attributes from various technologies in the same package. So this is what we do today. Uh, we've been doing it for a number of years now. This is a picture from about six years ago. Uh, chip on wafer on substrate, uh, putting diverse chips together. In this case, one system on the chip with two uh, DRAMs. You have, an, uh, you, some of you may have seen the other block that we, the block that we put out last week, uh, showing this chip, uh, this uh, interposer in here, rather big interposer, 2,500 millimeter square interposer, uh, putting two processors together and H, eight of the HBM chips, uh, DRAM chips integrated together. So this is how we're integrating the systems together. And there's a variety of packaging technology, uh, system integration technology, that covers a range of I.O. pin counts as well as substrate and reticle sizes. And each one of them offer you an opportunity to integrate diverse technologies together on the same package with reduced system cost. Today, much of the technology is driven by top-down system applications rather than bottom-up uh, device technology uh, uh, driven type of technology development. So let's focus on device technology for a moment. All right? uh, the history of semiconductor industry evolves over time. It, in the beginning, most of the applications were, it, most of the technology development were driven from the bottom. Applications came about because a certain device technology became available. For example, transistor radio was made possible by the invention of transistor, of course. And we, we, went, we go into the mini computer or PC era because microprocessors came around. And microprocessors in, at, is really made possible by the invention of the integrated circuits back in 1959. Mobile cell phones and things like that, all the mobile devices that we have, are really enabled by the invention of the NAND flash and display technology and energy efficient transistors. Because without the energy efficient transistors, you wouldn't be able to have the mobile devices that you have. You would have to run to the charging station every hour or so. So going forward, the computing workload is going to change. It's not going to be the same as we had in the PC era or the internet era or the mobile era. The computing workload it's already changing, but some of you may have said, well, it has already changed. Uh, AI and 5G calls for a very different kinds of computing workload. So I'd like to go for the rest of the talk, I would like to talk about how the technology needs to evolve to take into account of these changing computing workload. Now, this is a CHIPS conference, so I don't need to spend too much time on this slide that come from my colleague at Stanford, Sebastian Mitra. Uh, showing basically data movement with the memory wall. And I don't need to explain to you the, uh, uh, why the memory wall exists and, and, and what it is. But basically, the, the message I, I want to show in this uh, slide is today, memory access really controls the energy, energy efficiency of computing systems. So we really need to solve the memory wall problem. If you think about memory wall, okay, so what is the requirement 
Okay? Let's take deep neural networks as an example. It requires really large memory capacity. Right? Here are some examples from vision or, let, or language models and from CNN and uh, models and LSTM. For example, for training and inference and the amount of uh, the model size in terms of mega and of the order of hundreds of megabytes or gigabytes and the amount of memory that is needed, the footprints required is of the order of at least for inferencing of the order of gigabytes and for training is tens of gigabytes, right? This is uh, for today's problem, right? And we've seen this in these two days conferences, how big those problems are. This is for today's problem. Tomorrow's problem is going to be much more demanding on the memory capacity. So these are just examples that not nearly enough for tomorrow's problem. So let me ask this question uh, rhetorically. How much memory do we have? Uh, my students uh, here could plot some, uh, collect some from, from the data sheets for GPU and CPU, amount of SRAM on chip. They are typically of the order of, t order of tens of megabytes. And if I make the high hypothetical straight line projection for 1.4 nanometer technology node, I'm, saying, I'm not saying that there will be a 1.4 nanometer technology node like that. Uh, if you make a hypothetical projection into a 1.4 nanometer technology node, you will see roughly about four gigabytes of SRAM on chip. Now, remember the numbers you saw in the previous slide for training, you're talking about tens of gigabytes for today's problem. So clearly, there will never be enough. There will never be enough SRAM on the chip. So what do we do? What did we need to do is figure out first, how can we put lots of memory on chip? And second question, what kinds of memory and for which application? Because as I said before, device technology is application driven. All right, so this is what we do today. Uh, a uh, Cobalt module and putting HBMs along with GPU package on a chip, uh, on a package, and that's what we do today. And that's not enough memory that we would love to have a lot more. So take a step back and kind of take the whole world, broader view of packaging technology and device technology together. Today, we have what we call 2D systems, right? They're basically what I call a traditional baseline that has maybe like an off-chip DRAM on a, on a socket, on a, on a PC board, hooked up to a silicon logic die through very limited I.O. connectivity between the memory and the silicon logic die. Moving a little, little bit further, you have 2.5D system. You can have a stack DRAM chip on an interposer, connected to a silicon logic die. The interposer uh, have connecti horizontal connectivity uh, much better than what you can have in the previous 2D case between the PC board uh, and the silicon logic die. But, so the horizontal connectivity has greatly improved and the vertical connectivity in the DRAM chip has also improved by the use of these through silicon veers that can connect chips on a, in a 3D stack. Go one step further, you can have 40 3D through silicon veer or 3D TSV systems in which you can have HBM type DRAM stack on top of each other, connected by the through silicon veer to the silicon logic die underneath. Right. So, in this case, the through silicon veers, or the dense connection density, uh, today they are of the order of microns, uh, maybe like ten, nine to 10 micron pitch. You can go down to single digit micron pitch in the, th in the through silicon veer. So the connectivity in these 3D systems has been improved over the two and a half D system and over the 2D systems that I showed you earlier. Now, vertical connectivity and horizontal connectivity of the order of micron clearly is not enough if you are talking about very fine-grained access of, of memory by the logic die. So one step further, you would go to what I would call a next system, which basically is integrating logic and memory together 
in a fine-grained fashion. So this is a very complicated slide. Let me just walk you through. On the right-hand side, in the call-out box, I show several layers. There are the yellow layers, which are the logic layers. There's a red layer, which is a high-speed memory layer. The green layer is the high-capacity, high-density memory layer. And then, of course, you have the silicon logic die, the purple in the, underneath. And there are multiple layers of logic and multiple layers of memory. The high-density memory could be a 3D-type memory, just like what I called out on the, on the, on the left side of the plot, a, more or less like a 3D NAND-type situation, whereby your capacity is really high. So these kinds of systems have multiple layers of logic and multiple layers of memory integrated in a fine-grained fashion. Now, the, in, the connectivity between the memory and the logic is really the key for these kinds of systems to allow you to do huge amount of computation at higher energy efficiency. All right. Now, I talk a lot about memory. So what are the memories that are available and for what kinds of applications? For traditional memory, we have DRAM, SRAM, and flash. SRAM exists on, on, the, on the logic die. DRAM mostly exists off chip. And flash, obviously, is also off chip if you talk about uh, high, high capacity, uh, high density uh, flash. Fortunately, in the past maybe like 10, 15 years, the research world, academic world, as well as industry research has come up with a variety of new memory technologies, which I showed in here, that has several interesting characteristics. They are random access, they are non-volatile, they do not require a race before write, unlike in the, in the case of flash, and all of these can be integrated on chip onto the silicon logic die, onto the logic platform. Shown here are some examples, these are by no means an exhaustive list of all the possibilities. Many of them are in products today, for example, in the SCTM RAM, in the medic memory, Many of them, uh, they are already in products. Uh, in, in, for example, in 22 nanometer MRAM, we have a product on 22 nanometer MRAM process. They store information in the form of meta metatization, metatica uh, spins on chip. Phase change memory, uh, other companies have been able to put out products based on phase change memory. You heard about 3D cross point. And these can also be integrated on, on chip and these store information by the phase, phase meaning amorphous phase and crystalline phase of a material. Uh, 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 uh. The next uh, one, uh, the two are most the storing information in the form of ion motion ions in, the, in, the, in an oxide or in a dielectric. So in the case of RM, they store information by, this, uh, by moving uh, oxygen vacancies around and forming and disconnecting filaments of oxygen vacancies and making the resistance between the two electrodes high resistance or low resistance. So, and in the case of conductive rich memory, you're moving metal uh, ions and forming and disconnecting the uh, connections between the top electrode and the bottom electrode in the form of I, uh, con a percolation path of uh, metal ions. And the last one on the right, uh, store information in the ferroelectrics, in the dipole, the directions of the electric dipoles, the positive charge and positions of a positive charge and a negative charge in either directions. So all these memories can be integrated on chip. They are random access. They're non-volatile. They do not require a erase before write. And they can be integrated on chip at low temperature. All these memory that I show you here, and perhaps even some, some more that I did not show, can be fabricated at low temperature below the back end of the line temperature of 400 degrees C. And so you can basically integrate them with the logic in very fine grain in providing very tight memory logic integration. All right, so let me uh, kind of hypothetically think about what kind of benefits we're gonna get if we are able to integrate these kinds of memory on the logic platform. All right. So we have done, this is work done collaboratively through our university partners with Professor Mitra at Stanford in here. 
Let's start with a 2D baseline system in which we have an accelerator core and a uh, on-chip SRAM, in this case, uh, two megabytes of SRAM on chip, and uh, together with off-chip DRAM, basically with the list characteristics listed up in a slide, about four gigabytes of the off-chip DRAM. This is a baseline system that we're gonna, gonna compare with. What we're com gonna compare with is a new system, same accelerator core, same amount of SRAM, and same amount of off-chip DRAM minus a new memory, doesn't matter what it is, uh, we'll talk about it a little bit later, minus the capacity of the new memory. Now, this new memory is, exists not off-chip, they exist on-chip on the logic die. Okay? So the total capacity of the, of the memory, or main memory, remains the same, so it's more a fair comparison. So next, what we ought to do is to sweep, hypothetically sweep, the capacity, the latency, and the bandwidth of these new memory, and ask what are the most important things that we want out of this new memory. So here's some key results. I have two that I want to show you. This is the first one. These are all shown here, uh, the energy delay product benefits of the new system versus the traditional 2D baseline system that I showed you earlier. On the y-axis is bandwidth, on the x-axis is capacity. Let's focus on the, right, on the left hand side, we have the results for a language model like LSTM. On the right hand side, we have the results for a ResNet 152 or CNN model. The results are kind of similar. If you look at the you know, one on the left, focus the one on the left, you will see the benefits really showed up as soon as the memory that you have, the new memory that, uh, that exists on chip that you have, uh, fits it with the data size. In other words, the on-chip memory, the new memory on-chip capacity must exceed the data size that you would like to have. So this is a uh, simplified diagram, and I'll show you here the real data with the contours in here. You focus on the left-hand side, you see that all the contours are vertical, they are aligned, so there you see that, that means that the sensitive direction is on the x-axis. So once you ex exceed a certain capacity, in this case, the data size, then you would see huge benefits out of adding on-chip memory. The next thing that I want to is sweep is uh, look into sweeps of bandwidth and latency. Again, y-axis is list of bandwidth, x-axis is the latency. You see that in this case, the benefits exist, the benefits is high when you have exceeded a certain bandwidth, data bandwidth in here. And here are also the contours. You can see in this case, the contours are mostly horizontal, namely the sensitive direction is in the vertical direction in the bandwidth direction. So that means that Bandwidth is more important than latency, right? And so when you pick new memory, it's not quite that important to have, to spend a lot of time in improving the latency of the memory devices, but rather you need to spend a lot of time figuring out how to improve the bandwidth of this memory that you have. All right, so after all these sweeps, we'd like to ask if I could if put all these memory on chip in multiple layers of memory and logic, and I could also improve my logic, which I'll talk about a little bit about later, what kind of benefits we're gonna see? And here are some results in here running several kinds of, uh, of applications, including language models and vision and things like that. You see that there's a huge amount of benefits you can get out of these kinds of very tight memory logic integration with the memory that exists on chip. Okay. So here I alluded to, to the fact that we will have better transistors, right? So I just want to take a step back and recall, let you recall the system that we just, what I, will, I would like to uh, talk about, in, namely these kinds of multiple layers of logic and memory integrated together. The logic is important because you need to have a balance between the logic and the memory. You cannot have a humongous amount of memory with low logic because then your bandwidth will be severely limited because you cannot get access to the memory that you have. 
So the amount of logic that you have on chip and the amount of memory they have on chip has to be balanced, has to have a certain ratio. And so if you have a lot of memory on chip, then you need to have a, a lot of logic on chip as well. And the logic cannot be too far away from the memory. So your logic layer has to be as close, close to the memory layer as possible. So you need to have multiple layers of logic and memory interleave with each other. Now, this is not quite possible with today's technology because today's logic exists only in the bottommost layer, in the purple layer, in the silicon logic side. It's very difficult to build high-performance transistors on the upper layer because the silicon logic requires high temperature processes close to 1,000 degrees C, and when you have high temperature processes, you cannot, you, when you're fabricating the upper layer, then the bottom layer is get affected, and also all the wiring and the locate dielectrics that separate the wirings from each other will also degrade with the high temperature. So you need to have two things that happen in the device technology. One, you need to pick device technology that can be fabricated at low temperature, typically about for below 400 degrees C. Number two, you need to pick devices, transistors and memory alike, that are thin. Why do we need to have thin device layer? And that's because each layer cannot be, you need to drill holes through the layers to connect the various layers. And if the device layer is very thick, then you have a very tall hole that you need to drill with a very tiny diameter. And that gets very difficult. So you need to have device layers that are very thin. So two requirements, thin device layers and low fabrication temperature both for the logic and the memory devices. Remember, in the memory devices I showed you earlier, the variety of the memory devices that I showed you, they all can be fabricated at a low temperature. So what remains is, do we have transistor technologies at our disposal in our back of tricks that allowed us to do these kinds of three-dimensional integration? All right, so let's focus on the transistor itself for a moment. Luckily for transistors, there are new materials that are being investigated for the past many, many years now that allow you to be able to have very small transistors, high performance transistors, and fabricated at low temperature. And these do not use the bulk materials that we have been using so far, like silicon, or germanium, or even 3,5 compound sem semiconductors. Some examples are these two-dimensional layered materials uh, in the form of, uh, the acronym is TMD, and uh, I think I, sh I should uh, go slow in, in saying what this is. This is transition metal dichalcogenides. All right, so these are mater materials that are formed with the transition metals, such as tungsten or molybdenum, and then the other ones, uh, elements, is on the group six of the periodic table. These are sulfur, tellurium, selenium, and so on and so forth. Why do we, and the other kinds, these are two-dimensional layer materials. We also can have one-dimensional materials, such as carbon nanotubes. These materials have interesting properties. They have high carrier mobility, which gives you high current drive, and yet they are very thin. Why do we need them to be thin? And because when you shrink down a transistor, you need to maintain a certain aspect ratio between the length of the gate and the thickness of the transistor channel itself. If you shrink the transistor gate length, the channel has to be thin. And today, the channel is already very thin. There are only a few nanometers. Now, going forward, if you want to shrink even more, you need to go down to below two to three nanometers. In all the bulk materials that you have, silicon, germanium, silicon, germanium, and so on, the carrier mobility drops like a rock as it goes down to below two or three nanometer, as shown in this chart in here. However, for these two-dimensional layer materials, the one-dimensional carbon nanotubes, the carrier mobility maintain, remains very high, even though the thickness of the body is very, th is very thin, extremely thin, below two nanometers. So that's very important. 
All right, I'm going to show you some examples of these uh, devices. Uh, shown on the left-hand side are our modeling ex exercise to screen and select these two-dimensional layer materials. There are literally close to 1,000 of these two-dimensional layer materials that exist. And one need to select and find the proper materials. And what we find is that you need to have uh, materials that, of course, have high carrier mobility, but also have a reasonable effective mass so that the carrier tunneling directly from source to drain becomes, it doesn't become too high so that you cannot turn off the transistor. So we've discovered out of these selection processes that these, some of these tungsten-based materials and selenium-based material probably would be the right thing to use, and they would have on current, which is shown by the color contours in here, that are comparable to what we would expect to see with a transistor, for a transistor of these kinds of gate link. Now, the left-hand side is a the theoretical modeling. On the right-hand side, I show actual devices that we have made in our laboratories at, in Taiwan that are of a tungsten disulfide two-dimensional layer material transistor the paper was presented in the VSI Symposium uh, two months ago in, uh, in Kyoto. So these transistors exist, and they can be made. And in principle, if you have done everything right, they would have the proper current drive and on-off characteristics that you would expect to see for an advanced transistor. Oh, I pressed the wrong button, I guess. All right. So I show you two-dimensional layer materials. I want to show you one-dimensional material, in this case, common nanotube. Common nanotube has been around for quite some time, uh, probably more the, for the better part of 20 years now. By now, it has matured enough to be able to be fabricated into good devices, good transistors, and also relatively complex uh, systems. Here I show two examples from uh, Peking University in, in a publication in science showing a, on the left-hand side, 10 nanometer gauge transistor with both P-channel and N-channel characteristics. On the right-hand side is a 5 nanometer gauge link transistor, carbon energy transistors with excellent turn-on and turn-off characteristics with subthreshold slope of the order of 70 millivolts per decade similar to what you see in today's transistors that we make in silicon. These are not, not just single device demonstration, but also you can build up rather complex systems. My colleague, uh, Sebastian Smitra and myself, have shown in this earlier paper back in the, a couple of years ago in the 2013, a complete computer it built out of carbon nanotubes. No silicon other than wafers mechanical support that this nanotube is sitting on. It runs the MIPS uh, instruction set, and it can run two programs concurrently. So it's a bona fide computer. So you can build rather complex systems out of that. And uh, in two, uh, two months ago, our former student, Max Sulaker, who is a professor at MIT right now, it has shown in the VSI Symposium a uh, kilobit 60 SRAM cell. Um, not just a cell, but an array of SRAM built entirely out of carbon nanotubes. And in the papers from two years, from a year ago, uh, Max Schulacher also showed, when he was a student here at Stanford, a complete four-layer systems with RAM and carbon nanotubes integrated to, onto a silicon platform with two million carbon energy transistors and a median RM all on chip, all working together. So you can build rather complex systems out of these rather exotic materials. Okay, so after having said all that, I hope it's become clear that you not only need a better transistor for energy efficient computing going forward, a better transistor obviously is necessary. That's why we need to have more work on the transistor. But a better transistor alone is not going to give you what we want, a continuous benefit from node to node, after node after node. So you will need not only a better transistor, but a 
better transistors that are integrated with memory in 3D. Now, when you think about memory integrated in 3D with the logic, I'm not talking about a totally different device technology. It really, in this 3D integration, is a continuum from far back end to the front end. If you look at what we have today, from interposer technology to chip on wafer, wafer to wafer bonding to monolithic 3D integration, it's really a continuum of interconnection density, which are plotted on the y-axis in here, which spans roughly about six or seven orders of magnitude of integration of interconnection density. We're using a variety of system integration techniques. So we're not, I'm not talking about the 3D integration. I'm not talking about isolated technologies that needs to happen in a specific way, but rather a continuum that's of the methodologies that we have already used throughout the past decade or so. So going forward, the computing workload is going to be very different. As we saw today, AI and 5G is going to be a key to many of our applications that drives the technology development. And the societal needs for advanced technology is literally insatiable. And I don't think I need to convince you about that. The other things that I observe is that the advanced technology continues to be necessarily a key differentiator. Without advanced technology, you would not have the kinds of applications that we expect to see going forward. So developing advanced technology has many, many ways to get there, to provide the continuous benefits, node after node, not just one way. We, used, we are used to this very powerful knob of two-dimensional scaling, but going forward, we should be able to use a variety of techniques, just like what we have been in the past, in going from the NAS scaling to equivalent scaling to FinFetch to uh, DCCO. So going forward, it will be a different set of knobs that we're going to use, namely continuous transistor and memory advances in various forms, different materials, different design, different device architecture, and also memory logic integration, as well as system integration with very high connectivity between memory and logic together in a 3D fashion. And now, this is not easy because we are necessarily need to cut through many layers of abstraction from devices all the way to system application. And that requires really early engagement between system applications and chip designers and device technology people because the previous mode of operation of really separated this uh, operate, the development of device technology and system application does not work anymore. They have to have a much closer interaction between what the system designers would like to see and what kind of device technology would like to develop. Let me give an example. If you want to build something like this in this three-dimensional way, then today there's no design tools for 3D routing, there's no design tools for 3D place and route, there is no architecture that are actually take into account or take the benefits, or reap the benefits of memory logic integration, fine-grained memory access to the, by the logic layer. So many things need to happen together. And so we need to be able to have these kind of closer interaction between system technology, system design, and device technology development on the one hand, and also collaboration between academia and industry research on the other hand. With that, I'd like to thank you, the organizer, for inviting me to give this talk. I'll be happy to answer the questions. Here on the right. Uh, hello, David Cantor. So uh, was there any data on the variability for those CNT devices and SRAMs? 
Uh, yes, there are also, there are variability data, and you can see, I guess, in one of the slides that I show, that you can write sort of rather random patterns in the, into the, into the data. Uh, today, we are limited by what we can do in a university type fab, right? Mm -hmm. So the, much of the variability are due to the uncontrollable nature of university fab. And so I would expect that the variability of these uh, new materials uh, would not be very different. Uh, the sources of variability would not be very different from what we see in conventional silicon devices. Okay, thanks. Um, thank you for the great talk. I was wondering um, about the ener excess energy of the memory or the device switch energy of the transistor. Like how do they uh, affect the scaling of these processors, like 3D stack processors? I didn't quite catch the yeah, question. Yeah, can you repeat that question? Maybe put a mic closer to your okay. mouth. <laughs> The, the question is about the power, like the ener excess energy of the memory or the device switching energy for the transistor. How do they impact the, like going to um, next generation nodes or these uh, new 3D stacked processors? So I think the, the uh, question was the um, power of switching in today's transistors uh, versus memory. Does that change? So I heard about the... Um... Oh, okay, all right, got it, okay. So the, I guess your question was, what is the energy efficiency of the transistors and the memory that, we, uh, that I showed you earlier? Yeah, so we talked about, you talked about the thinning, like they need to be thin, mm -hmm. but I didn't hear about the excess energy or the switching mm -hmm. energy. Right, okay, so the transistor itself, uh, the, the 2D layer materials as well as the 1D uh, CNT, uh, we've done a lot of modeling uh, because the physics is pretty well known. All the band structures and carrier mobility and so on, they are well known. So we could actually predict quite well what the uh, uh, on-stage current would be or the off-stage current would be. And we actually have models that are out there, the device model that we use. And um, the good things about these transistors is that because they are very thin, you can turn them off very, very well. So the on-off characteristics are really good. So you will get really close to 60 millivolt per decade turn-off characteristics, even at very short gate lengths. And so you would be able, using these materials, you would be able to access gate lengths that conventional bulk transistors cannot access. For example, if you want to design, let's say, a five nanometer gate transistor for silicon, then your, uh, you, then your uh, carrier mobility would be very would be much lower than what you would see in, than compared to the these layer materials or the 1D transistors. So your on current would suffer. Or if you would say I want to ma maintain the same on off ratio, then you need to lengthen your gate length of the conventional transistors as compared to these 2D layer material transistors as you have a longer gauge, then you probably would have, and then you would have a, a smaller uh, on-stage current. So in other words, you, using these materials, you will be able to access, access the gauge length regime in which the, the shorter gauge length regime in which the conventional bulk materials cannot access. Thank you. Uh, Tao Zhang from Alibaba Dharma Academy. So, um, uh, hi, uh, Dr. Wong. Thank you very much for the uh, talk. It's a very, very nice talk. So I have a question about the uh, non-volatile memory. You mentioned the non-volatile memory in your talk, and uh, there's an uh, active research direction about the non-volatile memory is the uh, analog computing. That's a real processing memory. But in this year's ISSCC, actually, Yan Lequin gave a keynote, and in the last slides, he said that um, the analog computing may not have the future because the ADC and the DAC will kill us. So um, I'm wondering whether you have any comment on that or what's your um, pro uh, projection on the future of this uh, analog computing? Thanks. Okay, good, good. I guess everybody heard the question. Um, I don't have any particular comment about analog computing per se, uh, but I wanted to, what I do emphasize is that uh, device density is important. Right, and uh, to eat, one way to get higher density is through 3D integration and integration of logic and memory. I think those things are important for technology going forward. 
that, as I mentioned in the be way beginning of the talk, uh, density is really what drives Moore's law, and density continues to be important, and we need to be able to find ways to provide density, uh, device density, not only device density, but also density of, of connectivity between the devices, and those will remain uh, important. Thank you. I think we'll do one more question here on the left. Hi, Kevin Donnell with uh, Vian Systems. Thank you very much for your talk, Dr. Wong. Um, just a question for uh, companies like us just starting out developing AI software and apps. Uh, what advice do you have um, in terms of engaging earlier um, and working together sooner? Sorry, can you repeat the question? <laughs> Sorry, the question is around um, sort of uh, AI companies, software companies developing apps and software. Uh, you had talked about um, us engaging earlier with, uh, with manufacturers like you. Um, what, what does that look like, and, and what advice do you have uh, for companies like us just starting out? I think going forward, we will see a lot of uh, fine-grained memory integration with logic. So if you have algorithms or architecture that would capitalize on the availability of memory on logic, that would be uh, a sort of like a technology directions that I see going forward. Uh, in the past, the development of logic and memory has been rather separate, right? Because memory exists mostly standalone uh, off chip. So memory technology, for the fabrication of that memory technology has diverted, kind of diverged somewhat from the logic technology. And uh, going forward, I see more and more closer interaction between the logic and the memory. So I would expect to see more memory available on the logic die. And you already see some uh, indications today. Uh, you could find uh, products that we offer, the TSMC, for example, TSMC offer that has uh, MRAM integrated on the 22 nanometer logic, for example, or RAM integrated on 22 nanometer logic. So those are beginning to be available. And uh, it just take, it takes kind of early engagement between kind of researchers like yourself who has a system view and architectural view and engage with the technology side. And so we, together we can figure out what are the right technology mix for your architecture. Thank you. All right, that was a, a very inspiring keynote. Let's thank the speaker, speaker again. Thank, thank you. you.